I'm going to just uh, take a little bit, maybe a minute or so, as a broader introduction before we get into issues that I think are important to all of us. So um, the question we always get asked from people who aren't in cure research is, what is really the rationale for why we're intensifying cure research? And I think everybody in this room is aware of that, but I think it's worth stating in the beginning of the meeting <coughs> And one of the most important ones is that it really is not economically or logistically feasible to be delivering our every day to 37 million HIV infected people and the 1.8 million people who get infected every year. There's the problem of adherence to care continuum, there's drug resistance, and there's also the stigma of having to take the medication every day for a disease that has a lot of stigmatization associated with it. Uh, some interest to you to understand the commitment we've put into this. If you look at the NIAID HIV AIDS funding, it reflects the funding of the entire NIH, which is essentially flat. As you know, we've had increases in budget. A lot of that has been earmarked, the Brain Initiative, Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, personalized medicine. Not a lot has gone to increase HIV AIDS in general. However, over those same years, if you superimpose the amount that we have been spending on pure research, it has gone up substantially within the context, which tells you something that's obvious, that we have pure research, the things that people in this room are doing, as a very high priority within the constraints of a budget that's limited. If you look at the publications in cure-related research, both HIV and cure, or HIV and reservoir of latency and compare 2000 with 2017, it becomes obvious that there has been a considerable amount of increased interest and productivity and advancements in our understanding of cure. The research takes many, many approaches. I'm clearly not gonna go over each and every one of these, but just to show you that there are a number of these and many people in this room are approaching one or more of these. So what I'm gonna talk about this morning is something that I have been speaking to this group intimately about, and the field does change in advance, is the multiple, in this case, two major pathways to what I'm gonna be calling an art-free HIV remission, as opposed to the title being CURE. CURE is one of the pathways to an art-free remission. So let's take a look at the classic eradicating the replication-competent HIV reservoir, which we call a classic cure. There are a number of approaches on this. I could spend my entire 20 minutes on each of these gray boxes. A lot of very elegant work has been done, not with complete success except for one single outlier, but nonetheless, the importance of continuing for this approach is very, very clear. The lack of success should not prevent us from continuing to pursue that. However, I must point out, and I think we all need to realize it, in your individual labs, you need to worry about the specific approach you're taking. When I take off my researcher hat and put on my public health hat, I have to address the important issue that the rest of the world looks at which is the risk-benefit, both to the patient and to the expense of a cure, of eradication, versus what we can do right now with essentially keeping a person in full remission, not everybody, but most people, with essentially one pill a day. And here is the single pill combination antiretroviral drugs that many of us in this room, myself include, included, administer to patients on a daily basis in our clinics and in our wards. So I'm gonna move on quickly to what I wanna spend most of the time on is that that isn't an eradication cure, but a control of viral rebound without eradication of HIV in the absence of all, which I refer to as a sustained virological remission, which in fact, if continued over time, might ultimately lead, I don't know, but might, to an attenuation of the reservoir and actually, in the process of sustaining the remission, lead to a cure. That's an aspiration we don't know. The criteria that I always use from a public health standpoint, that when you're trying to get a person off one pill a day to an alternative therapeutic approach, 
It has to be low risk to the patient. It has to be scalable. And it could potentially, as I mentioned, lead to the induction of a durable immune-mediated control. And I'm going to take two approaches to this over the next several minutes. The first is an odd-free remission, <clears throat> but one that requires some intermittent or continual non-ART intervention. In other words, you're not completely off everything. The two major approaches that I want to talk about, not the exclusive approaches, but two of the major ones are shown on this slide. The first is a therapeutic vaccination. If one reviews the literature, there have been no therapeutic vaccination studies that when using an analytical treatment interruption as the endpoint has shown to have a durable control. And in fact, in order to just prove to ourselves that this was the case, we did a randomized control study that was published several months ago in Science Translational Medicine using an adjuvanted prime boost vaccine in individuals who initiated antiretroviral therapy early in infection, a study that was done by Mike Sneller and Ted Yook Chung in the lab. And as you can see, if you compare the placebo to the vaccine in the percent of subjects who were suppressing plasma viremia of less than 40 on the left or less than 400 <coughs> copies on the right, there was no difference whatsoever between the placebo and the vaccine group. But importantly, and I brought this out at a prior meeting, and it's really become an important thing that we're all dealing with, is that if you look at the placebo group, we are starting to find in 2018, with the regimens that we're using, much more powerful than in 1996, 97, and given to people much more early in the course of their infection, that as a matter of fact, some people, when you do nothing to them and stop their therapy, they go on for a considerable period of time, sometimes years, and they are not elite controllers from a genetic standpoint or any other standpoint. This is something we really need to pay attention to. It not only emphasizes the importance of placebo-controlled trials, but it also emphasizes that there's a tremendous amount of variability among individuals who you do nothing to except an analytical treatment introduction. And in fact, Jonathan Lee has recently published a very interesting paper in the JID. If you look at the last bullet, in individuals in this CHAMP study who are post-treatment controllers, 55% maintain their HIV control for two years and 20% for five years. That's with doing nothing to them. So we really need to keep that in mind when we analyze the data of interventions. The other that has taken a very important role in many people, and it's a very interesting uh, alternative to what we're talking about, is the passive transfer of broadly neutralizing antibodies. So we're all familiar with the now famous HIV trimer of the envelope that has multiple major neutralizing epitopes that have been identified by the isolation and cloning of monoclonal antibodies from a number of HIV-infected individuals which have served to actually identify the epitopes that would be used as immunogens for a vaccine. However, there are a role, there is a role for the mon monoclonal broadly neutralizing antibodies anyway. And that is to see if you can control virus by passive infusion in individuals who are treated and suppressed on ART who you want to perform an analytical treatment interruption. And this was done uh, about two years ago, uh, and has been done since by others, uh, by Michelle Nilsson-Zweig in his group, and Taeyuk Chung and, and, uh, in my group, and uh, Pablo Tebas. Uh, they combined our papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what we found that indeed, if you passively transfer either 3 bnc 117 or BRCA1, you have a delay in rebound, which you would expect. But the real question being, can you substitute a monoclonal antibody intermittently to daily ART? Our delay was modest. It went from around 11 to 28 days up to 39 days. Michelle with 3BNC117 
had a bit longer delay, but the end of the day is that if you can delay somewhat, then you have an option. You have an option that's shown on this slide. You can start trying to get the system to work in your favor. You can do more potent antibodies, extend half-life, vector-based combinations. I only have time to show you results from two approaches. And one is extending the half-life of antibodies. And you're all familiar with the fact that we now have LS mutations which can actually prolong for a considerable period of time, sometimes with a half-life of 22, 25 weeks, which when you think about that, that's half a year already. Now, there was a study by Mal Martin and Michelle Nussensweig recently, which was looking about prevention, not trying to get people off ART, but the principle totally applies to trying to get somebody off ART. And as you can see, the controls on the left and the delay with both 3 b and C117 and 101074 LS. So that's the long-acting anti, uh, antibody, uh, broadly neutralizing antibody. The other is something that everyone is now interested in, the combination of antibodies. There have been two studies that came out just a couple of weeks ago from Michelle Lutz's Vibe Lab using 3 b and C117 and 101074 which suppressed for months in the absence of ART. So if you can do that, the critical question to ask is the ultimate goal of this, that perhaps maybe every six months or even less, get a regimen of passive transfer of combinations of bromine neutralizing antibody, which could actually replace daily antiretroviral therapy. It would get rid of a pill a day and it would have somebody only have an intervention, hopefully, two times a year, which is an important goal, and I think that we are gonna to get to that goal. The other is an art-free remission that results from inducing a durable, immune-mediated control without further intervention. So you don't have to go every six months or every four months with passively transferring something or a therapeutic vaccine that you have to boost every year, but you can actually do something that's durable. And there are two approaches, one of which we have taken that has been interesting, complicating, and very challenging, and that is the passive transfer of antibodies to integrate alpha-4, beta-7 following infection. Now, many of you now are aware that alpha-4, beta-7 is an integrant whose function is to mediate migration and retention of leukocytes in the gut a number of labs have clearly shown now that this has an important role in the pathogenesis of HIV infection because as we showed years ago, it identifies a population of cells, it binds to and signals alpha-4, beta-7 positive, CD4 positive T cells, and those cells are highly susceptible to infection and in fact, others have shown that individuals who start off with high alpha-4, beta-7, high cells are more prone to infection, all other things being equal, and have a more progressive disease. We partnered with a group who does non-human primate studies, Tab Ansari and Francois Village, and did a prevention study that showed if you passively transfer and challenge by mucosal challenge, as shown by this kaplan Meyer, you can prevent infection in many of the animals, half of them, but in the others who do get infected, they have a pronounced delay in viremia. So that triggered a study that was performed by Tab Ansari and Emery, in which they had a situation where they took animals, deliberately infected them, 